though. I awesome. figured I figured it out. Do you have to do the code? I do. Make I it do work every time. I thought so. Or the key or whatever. Yep, the stream key. And it had been working. We'll see if it works tonight. Yeah, there we go. That's fun. Very Tonight's the first fun. night that uh, if if Stu joins us, it's the first night I'll be seeing if my backgrounds work with uh, four people. Mm. Your backgrounds? I I don't have a I've never tested them with four people, so it'll be fun to right fun to chat about. Oh, I see. The, yeah, <laughs> I thought you meant actually behind you. <laughs> oh <laughs> like no, room. I don't know why. <laughs> it's, very, it's a very me thing. There Heck we go. Yeah, we were Abo. Three. Is it just me, or is it a little too optimistic around uh, around St. Louis City right now? <laughs> well, coming winning, from the optimist. Yeah, winning cures everything. So that's fair. There you go. Here's Stu. Hey, Stu, what's Stu. up? Hey guys. <clears throat> what's up, buddy? Uh. Discord didn't want to work for me on my laptop, so I had to restart. So yeah. <clears throat> it took me a few minutes. We're ready Stu to go is, whenever you are. Yeah, I'm going to get going. Uh, Stu, is there anything you want to touch on today? Like specifically, like you want to talk about about Austin? I mean, Austin's uh, – I mean, I read through the notes, and I've been looking through their fan notes, and, I mean, their fan reactions aren't – super uh made credible because they're just kind of a meltdown um <clears throat> but uh i mean expectations were fairly high from their fans before the off season just because of uh bringing in rudolfo uh yeah it anytime you're playing uh zardis at all, you're you're a bad sign. But they were they were playing Will Bruin last year, and he was completely washed, unfortunately for him. But yeah, that's true. I don't know. Um, gosh, I saw someone online saying if they sh asking if they should bet on this game if it was a safe bet. That's like you never bet on MLS. No, safe yeah. bet which which way? <laughs> uh, for us to win. Um, oh man. Okay. Well, I'm going to hit record and we'll get right into it. Oh, glad I waited. Welcome everyone to fly over footy on the big 550 KTRS. We got a fun show tonight. It's a lot of positivity as Matt was saying before this show and we are here to continue that, and maybe we'll challenge it. Maybe we'll shut it down. We'll see. Abba's joining us in the chat and was talking about it. So thanks for joining us in the chat. Anyone is welcome to do that if you log in with us on a Thursday night. I got all my friends here tonight. Matt Baker, Santiago Beltran, Stu Holtgren. Stu, let's start with you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a beautiful day today. You know, that wonderful St. Louis spring weather of uh, 50 degrees overcast and raining. <laughs> right, following a beautiful day that was in the 70s and sh and, sh and sunshiny, so it's just that time of year, but it is beautiful. Santiago, how's it going for you, man? Doing great. It's been a great week, obviously, after a win, the first win of, of the MLS season. Um, it's a great feeling, and just looking forward to the first away game against Austin. You, with uh, the man I'm about to cut to here, with Matt Baker, did your first fallout of the week, of the season, rather. So uh, that was a really good listen the other day. You guys feeling like the the season's officially started now? For sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Although this was our second fallout. But, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it, it felt like the first one just because uh, it was a happy one and uh, it, had, it had been a while <laughs> since we had had an episode to talk about a win. So, so yeah, we can say it was the first happy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt was so excited about this one, so I was really focusing on it. But, yeah, Matt, you were really happy with this fallout. 
It felt like I really was. It felt like the RSL fallout was a dress rehearsal for what we ended up ended up being able to celebrate about New York City. And I think it's because CONCACAF Champions Cup was just such a, an up and down roller coaster with the beginning of the MLS season. It was like a fire hose was unleashed to start the season. We didn't get a chance to really settle into anything until New York City. And we had been bounced from CONCACAF Champions Cup. And we were still dealing with some injury issues, but things rounded into such a good form for St. Louis City against New York City. And I was happy to celebrate it. I'm happy that we're going into this week, seeing some positive news on the injury front. We've got good news on the St. Louis side as far as how how training's been going, the general vibe. And for better or for worse, we're in a good position when it comes to our expected matchup against Austin FC. Absolutely. And uh, Matt, I mean, you kind of I thought you were going to go right into it because we do have player avail- availability updates. I'd love to hear what you guys found out this week. I'm definitely not going to step on your toes as far as those transitions, Phil. Um, I, 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 will, I will I will let the segments build upon themselves. But no, it really was. Um, nothing happened new net new in training this week, which was a positive. The good news is the two words or rather the five words or so that everybody really desperately has been wanting to hear Rasmus Alm is now healthy. And that in and of itself is reason to celebrate. Uh, Bradley Carnell said in reference to uh, could Rasmus Alm feature or could Rasmus Alm play Bradley Carnell said today, I think he could, he's been cleared and is feeling good, tons of energy and we're looking to travel him. So this is the news everybody has been waiting to see since Alm had his sports hernia surgery in November and has been slowly rehabbing, slowly getting back, not rushed at all. And we had talked about whether he could contribute during that fixture congestion. It's good to have him back. It's good to have him possibly available for the game day roster. And we could probably stop there and no matter what else happens, be happy. But Mm -hmm. the other bits of news are Kyle Hebert is progressing as well. He'll probably carry a questionable designation into the weekend with his knee progressing, training with the team, Jabulu Blome is going to be unavailable. He continues some solo work when Bradley Carnell was very clear that they're they're not looking to rush him back. Same with Josh Yarrow, likely out. He trained solo on Thursday as well. He might not travel, but Carnell said he should be available soon. So we've got a couple players out. So some of that depth that we needed coming into the season is really able to pick up the pieces. So you've got Chris Durkin. You have a healthy Joachim Nilsson. Things that you know you could put into place to cover for some of these players. It's all it's all good news to have these guys trending positive, and it's especially good news to have Rasmus Alm coming back. Colton Cook says, would love to have Alm back. I think people were starting to forget about him a little bit, and it'll be so nice to have him back. Stuart, um, of that list of players, anything you're especially excited about, implications about our center backs, anything you'd like to say there? I mean, I was, uh, I'm really liking what I'm seeing from Nielsen so far. Uh, Obviously, he has massive pedigree. Uh, at the end of last year, if you remember, people were talking about, I think it was Taylor Twelman talked about how he, we were winless in games that Nielsen started. Or uh, <laughs> he, had a, he had a comment with a, a stat line that was rather misleading given. Yeah, I, I think it's always unfair, uh, especially he was basically coming into the season new. I know he had been around the previous year, but with his injury, he didn't have time to get up to speed. Um, I mean, Nielsen's the guy that I'm really zeroing in on so far, uh, though I also want to see a little bit more of, of Nukvi. I think he's going to turn some heads this year. All right. What about you, Santiago? Any thoughts on anything you heard from the week uh, as well about these injury uh, availability reports? Oh, excited about um, Rasmus Alm's uh, progression because um, earlier in the week on, on Tuesday, Bradley Carnell was positive, but uh, he hesitated and said, ah, maybe uh, against LA Galaxy from the bench. So seeing that a couple of days later, uh, he's more confident that Rasmus uh, may be available for this game against Austin is, is great. And uh, you guys were talking about records uh, related to when Nilsson played last year. Uh, mm-hmm. On the other side, when Rasmus played last year, the team had a a great record. Um, so yeah, excited about seeing him back and hopefully he's healthy uh, the whole year and can show uh, how important he is for the team. 
it's so nice that Japulo Blom is hurt and we're not like worried about it. I feel like that was a big deal last year. And so it was a having huge Durkin, deal last year. yeah, yeah, yeah. So having Durkin, um, it makes us feel better about Miggy Perez being out on loan, right? Um, that it we got guys to fill those holes. So um, good stuff on the availability. Let's dig right into Austin. We have a lot of stuff to cover today. Matt, let's kick straight to you about our standings and our form, where we where we are in the standings in the form in the last couple games. This is such a fun matchup for me, uh, partly because it goes back to last season and so the memories that we had in Austin and how we started our season and now we get to start our away portion of our season this year. But as St. Louis coming into this match, we are currently tied for first in the West. And I know it's way too early <laughs> to talk about tied for first or first of anything, mm -hmm. but... It's a fact. Tied first in the West. One win, one draw, four points, and a plus two goal differential. Our form in the last three games, everybody knows it. We drew RSL at home two weeks ago, one to one. We lost against Houston in the CONCACAF Champions Cup, one nothing about a week and a half ago. And then we defeated NYC FC, or the artists formerly known as NYC FC, <laughs> two nothing last week in their mini rebranding. Um, no more midweek matches, though, guys, until May 15th against LAFC. So don't, don't, worry about any of this that fixture congestion is over we're riding into this now in a regular cadence austin austin is coming into this with i like i like to frame where austin is coming into this season so Stu mentioned their expectations coming in and something that we're going to refer back to a lot in this uh, episode is i had a chance to talk to the guys down at we are austin tv one of their media outlets down there that does a fantastic job of covering Austin FC. They do Instagram. They do fan reactions after the game. They do podcast uh, X, everything like that. And so I asked them, what are their overall expectations for Austin coming into this season? And they said some, if not most people, along with their new sporting director, Rodolfo Borrell, would say that their expectations coming into the season are to make the playoffs. But from their perspective, and Stu alluded to this a little bit, the first two games, it's looking like at the very least, they're going to finish at the, at best anywhere between eighth and 10th. The difference between this year and last year is that they have a slightly better roster with a few big signings planned for the summer, but it's not looking too great after two games. And after those two games, they sit tied ninth in the West. It's a, it's, it's a huge log jam of teams at the bottom of the conference tied for ninth with no wins, one tie, one loss, one point and a minus one goal differential. In the last two games in MLS, which are the only two games they've played, Austin lost 2-1 to one at home against Minnesota United, and they drew Seattle at Seattle last week. When I asked the, Austin, the We Are Austin TV crew that the year started off with that, that loss and then the draw, what are some of those takeaways? So what can we expect from those couple of games that Austin may be looking to capitalize on or that they're dealing with just in the overall framing of their game? And they said it's tricky to analyze because they didn't have their perennial MVP candidate, Sebastian Driussi. We're going to touch on Driussi in a little bit because they might not have him against St. Louis. But for both of those first two games, he wasn't an option. So with him not on the field, they might not have been as bad against Minnesota. They might not have been so defensive focused against Seattle. So those are some big takeaways in that tactics would likely remain the same with or without Driussi, where they're going to be playing the ball out of the back a little bit, looking to carry the ball to the opposing half of the field, get the ball to their wingers in for a cross. They mentioned that in the first in the in the game against Seattle, Diego Rubio, who earned his first start for Austin, seemed to add a little more creativity, as well as when he subbed in for Giassi Zardes in the second half against Minnesota. Against Seattle, they were pretty defensive minded. They didn't have very many shots on target. We're going to get into the stats in a little bit. But one big difference between the first game and the second game for Austin is that they felt they started that first game against Minnesota completely lost mentally. Against Seattle, they seemed a little more organized defensively, a little more focused. They, their first touch, their short passing was poor in both games. Players were collapsing under pressure and limiting their transition attack, but they seemed to bunker down better. And, and I don't know if this is indicative of losing Driussi or not having him available, but that's a, that's a big storyline for me going into this is the fact that Austin seemed like their, their ability to play without Driussi focuses on being defensive-minded as opposed to generating chances. Yes, yeah, we were talking ahead of this game about kind of the lineup that Austin has. Um, it, when you listen to Extra Time kind of go over what every team is working with this season a couple weeks ago, boy, they were pretty harsh on Austin. And uh, Stuart, you were kind of echoing that when we were talking. If you wanted to kind of hit on some of those thoughts again, please, please do so. Uh, 
Well, just looking at their lineup, uh, I'm actually just looking around, seeing what some Austin fans are saying. Uh, one of their concerns is that the style of play that they that uh, Wolf wants to play is uh, they don't have the talent for it, which means that they're kind of suspect and vulnerable to kind of our press. If you remember, you know, not only the home or not home opener, but the inaugural game last year in which we beat them. We also beat them 6-3 at home last year. So we're kind of their bogey team. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, Drew is going to kind of shift the focus of the game, but always coming off of an injury, I'm not going to bank on it. But for what it's worth, getting one point away at Seattle is nothing to uh, sneeze at. I mean, it's a hard place to play, even if your XG is... <laughs> Pretty bad, Nothing. but I think Matt will probably get into that at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, their their lineup doesn't seem particularly scary on paper, knock on wood. But anytime you're starting or playing uh, Zardis um, up top in this day and age, your, your attack's not going to be amazing. I hate to say it, but I think you might be right about a lot of those things there. Santiago, any other thoughts about Austin, the roster, what we might be seeing? I thought it was interesting. Both Stu and Matt talked about how they're going to have to bunker down, maybe because of that talent level, huh? Yeah, yeah. Just looking at um, who they added and the players that left, I was surprised. Uh, yeah, they, they added Diego Rubio, uh, Ader O'Brien, and... Uh, also a Brazilian Brazilian left back, but uh, still, I I think they are still missing like uh, adding another big piece, and they depend too much on uh, Sebastian Drusi, which we don't know if he's gonna play. And I was talking to uh, Jorge Turralde; he's a reporter that covers um, Austin in uh, in in Austin, and he was telling me I was asking him about expectations, and what he was saying was like, yeah, like the the new um, the new sporting director, like uh, his plan is more like a longer term than um, just 2024 um, because basically they have too many players with high salaries. So uh, he thinks it's going to take until next year to uh, get rid of some some of those players with higher salaries and uh, bring some new players that uh, suit better for the style that the team and uh, Josh Wolf want to play. So... Uh, to me, based on that, it's a team in transition. And uh, just with the way they depend so much on Drusi right now, uh, if Drusi doesn't play, I think uh, City uh, will have a, a slight advantage. Edgar NAG's uh, mentioning Drusi might be out two more weeks is what he's hearing. I think we're going to touch on that and the center backs that are out that he has just mentioned. Um, Kip Keller, not there anymore. Uh, St. Louis, and of course... Uh, so we're going to dig a little bit deeper. We're flyover footy on the big 550 KTRS. We thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Let's dig a little deeper. We've we've kind of introduced some information here, and now we're going to get a little nerdier with some stats and things, right? Yeah, I love, I love Edgar's note there because th this is something the Austin guys have been tracking as closely as they can. And Edgar's a good friend of ours out in L.A. He, he covers the Galaxy for News Across Galaxy. Oh, sweet. And and yeah, we, we go back and forth. I'll be on their show next week previewing the L.A. Galaxy. But he's right. And they have every right to be worried because in two games without Sebastian Driussi, their stats were pretty abysmal. Uh, going into this matchup, Austin had... Austin, Austin has kind of allowed other teams to dictate the pace of play. So going up against Minnesota United and then Seattle, knowing how those two teams both like to either possess the ball or drop back in low block. So we remember Minnesota United from last year. They, they dropped back in a low block. They, they were one of the first teams of the year to really frustrate us. Austin had 52% possession against Minnesota. They had 43% possession against Seattle. They went back and forth because of the way those other two teams like to play. So Austin doesn't it isn't a good team in 2024 at dictating any kind of a pace and so that bodes well for what st louis typically likes to do in playing against the ball so giving austin the ball the austin has had one game like i said 50 plus percent possession i look for more of the same with the shots on target shots in general if you compare st louis's first two mls games to austin it could not be in starker contrast and some of the things that lead into those shots as well so Shots, shots on target. St. Louis has 30 shots and seven shots on target through two games. Austin has 11 and three. Three shots on target through two games. 
key passes leading into that. So these are passes that lead directly into a shot. St. Louis in the first two games has 21 key passes, led notably by Edu Leuven, who has eight of those and is a tied for league leader. Austin has eight as a team. So Edu Leuven through two games has as many key passes as the entire Austin FC team. Shot, uh, shot, count, shot considering action. So the two offensive actions that lead directly into a shot, shot creating actions per 90 minutes. St. Louis has 19 shot creating actions per 90 minutes and Austin has 10. So St. Louis is doubling Austin in their ability to get the ball into positions that would generate shots. Tackles, both teams have, both teams are pretty high on tackling. So where I look for Austin to be a little more, a little more brave, a little more frustrating for St. Louis is their ability to tackle. They're, they're very gritty. They're going to be playing in the trenches in this game. But intercepting the ball, St. Louis has 25 interceptions through two games. Austin only has 17. This benefits St. Louis because in the first couple of games, especially with New York City, St. Louis has shown an ability to progress the ball on the ground, but still using some of those medium to long range passes. And if Austin isn't a good team at intercepting these passes, that bodes well for St. Louis into continuing to progress like they did against NYCFC. Progressive carries. This is a key stat for Austin because of what we heard from We Are Austin TV. Austin moves the ball out of the back. They play the ball out of the back. They'll carry the ball up into the midline, and then they'll try and pass the ball to get into some dangerous areas. If they can't progress the ball through progressive carries, they're not going to be effective at playing the ball out of the back. And through two games, Austin is the third lowest team in number of progressive carries. This is, again, boding well for the St. Louis press to frustrate them, to get them unable to move the ball consistently into the attacking sequence. And if St. Louis is effective at their press, which by all, all accounts, this 2024 Austin team is vulnerable, then I think St. Louis has a good opportunity to play their style and really dictate their style of play for the full 90 minutes. And if they can do that into the second half, we see a scenario where Bradley Carnell can now make the tactical kind of subs that he was doing against New York City. Those like-for-like like subs that Santi and I talked about on Flyover Fallout, where Carnell had the luxury of not needing to make tactical changes, bringing in an, uh, an attacker for a defensive player or shifting the formation like we had seen against Real Salt Lake and against Houston once. He was able to say, this is working for us in the first half. We are dictating everything as we need to, and we're staying with it. So bringing in uh, Klaus as, as the attacker in, in the, sh the, the formation stays the same. You know, those kinds of things really benefit Bradley Carnell in the second half when he gets that flexibility to not need to change the game plan. And I think Austin is ripe for the taking in that regard. Very interesting. I mean, I liked hearing all of this thing. It is sounding like a really good game for City, but at the same time, we also did mention that there might be some bunkering, right, Matt? And so maybe you can speak on that. Like, if they do bunker, that does seem to be our weakness in the past. I'm curious what you think. I think our I would point to our midfield as a real benefit, a, the, a glimmer of hope in that regard. Mm -hmm. Because yes, we, we had issues last season when we we were ineffective in how we were progressing the ball, able to spread the back line, able to spread the defensive midfield in a team that bunkers down. They have six or seven players in the box, and when that happens, it it inherently means that St. Louis hasn't progressed the ball quickly enough to where they're comfortable in their style of play to get off a good shot. St. Louis doesn't hold on to the ball. Some of the stats in the first couple of games for St. Louis really mirror what we saw last year in the second fewest passes per sequence, the third most direct team in all of MLS through two games. When you're a team like that for St. Louis, you're designed around, you're designed to get ahead of a team before they can fall back into a low block. And so when a team's able to do that, I think you have to look at Edu Leuven, Chris Durkin, and probably AZ Jackson at the center attacking mid for how you're going to stretch the field, how you're going to be purposeful in your passes and be able to slip in behind some of these defenders. The movements in the attacking third have a lot of possibilities, and we took advantage when NYCFC was trying to drop back a little bit too. And I really enjoyed seeing how Eddie Leuven was able to spray the field in the right ways, and they weren't afraid of pulling the ball back and taking a second look. So many times in 2023, I, I can't count the number of times that St. Louis would try to force something into the penalty box because they didn't have the skill set or the training to pull the ball back and either switch it to the other side of the field or try something different in the channel or maybe more direct to goal from a different angle. The team that we saw against NYCFC gives me hope 
that they're able to do that. AZ Jackson presses in, and if he gets swarmed with two or three defenders, he can pull the ball back quickly, spray it to Thomas Totlin, and he can go down the wing. You know, St. Louis has options now of higher quality than they did last season, who's better handling the ball. And I think that's one of the big benefits to breaking down a low block. And not to be overly negative, because um, that all makes sense to me, and I completely agree with everything, but we will see how that goes on a team that doesn't like possession like New York City did, does. Mm. Um, and you know, and we'll see if they're like bunkered real deep, it might be a battle to, uh, be able to press them at all. Like, you know, the playoffs against Kansas city, it was really similar to that. Santiago Stewart, any thoughts on that or any other statistics that, that Matt kind of went over here? No, I think the team, uh, as Matt was saying, the team has improved, uh, in, uh, possessing the ball and being more patient and, in building the play and looking for another option, not relying so much on on the long ball. Uh, that's something I have liked uh, this year so far. And uh, I think Carnell and his coaching staff knew that that's something that had to improve and they had been working on that. And uh, I think uh, the, the issue with teams uh, just uh, defending a low block and with a lot of people, I think the team is now uh, better suited to uh, to attack that if, if a team plays that way. So uh, so yeah, I think it's it's a process and it's gonna take a few games. But I like what I'm seeing so far. So uh, I'm not worried about that. Hey, Romo asks, do you think Coach Bradley will be aggressive on Saturday, Stuart? I think that's a pretty easy answer, don't you? <laughs> please please answer this question and and do fill us in on anything else you're thinking here. Uh, yes, I would. I would hope so. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> it um, seems to be the standard, right? Yeah. One one thing, one matchup that I'm interested to see, and I, I'm curious to see what you guys think, is where uh, Javier uh, Obrian lines up because he plays both left and right side, and he kind of gave us fits when he was playing with FC Dallas last year. So that was uh, matched up against Jake Nerwinski when he was playing on the left. Um, I believe he's been starting on the right or playing on the right for Austin this year. Does he play on the right and attack Markanic, or do you think he he goes to the left and attacks Totland? I don't know if it matters because I mean he's just such a an athletic player, and I you know I, I get caught every time I say that as a player exactly like him isn't going to do well they do just like you said obreon scored on us on us last time and i think i talked a little bit of trash about it so i'm curious to see the same thing too i'm not too worried about the defending this time but man i could be wrong again what do you guys think i think he started on the right side against seattle and they had uh rigoni over on the left mm. where diego rubio was was their um striker number nine uh, um but if he's on that side I do think, uh, and, and this brings up an interesting question. Is it Markanic or is it Dewar that he's going to be facing? I, no. I probably will go with Markanic, who was pretty impressive himself in his, his 21 defending, though I think um, what happened that I saw a few times against NYCFC is Chris Durkin was providing a lot of cover for our fullbacks. And so yes. whether it was whether it was Markanic being uh, pushing high on the left and then Durkin defending as in that more left back or left center back role as cover or vice versa on the right side with Totlin. I think that's the X factor in, in mitigating some of these wings is what can Chris Durkin do to provide cover defensively and him shading. It's not just, it's, we're going to talk about the, the partnership between Durkin and Leuven in a minute. Cause I love that. But what Chris Durkin brings defensively because he is so comfortable in that, at number six role. He's so comfortable in being the player who creates things for others. He does the dirty work. He's not, not afraid to make those challenges. And yeah, there was, a, there was, there was some, he had some fouls, you know, there were some challenges against NYCFC that I think some of us say would, that was a little you know misguided, but he takes these chances because he thinks they're worthwhile. And I want that kind of brave attacking center defense mid who's not afraid to go into battle against a, a winger or not afraid to stop a run from occurring. You know, I, I would rather have that than be more passive and let a, let a pass slip by you or let a player feel comfortable enough that they can make a dangerous pass. That's what Chris Durkin is going to do for Obreon and for Rigoni, I think. And what he, he's, he's my X factor in a lot of different ways in this game. 
We're Flyover Footy on the Big 550 KTRS, and we're going to continue here. Stuart, it was perfect. You brought up um, bringing up Obreon, rather, uh, and where he's going to be playing. I think we should talk some more about players, Matt. What do you think? Yeah, I I want to talk about a player from St. Louis who I don't think he got a lot of credit against NYCFC because it was not a noteworthy performance uh, overtly. He didn't make team of the match day like his center back partner, Joachim Nielsen did. I want to talk about Tim Parker for a second, because of all of the things that we talk about that NYCFC match that went well, that St. Louis is looking to carry into Austin from the finishing, the, the ball progression, the one V one defending that Joachim Nielsen was doing our fullback progression up the field a lot of it doesn't work without what Tim Parker was able to do in his passing effectiveness out of the back. So we often think of the number six, the pivot as the person who sprays the ball and directs the ball to a fullback or to the, the midfielder up the field. But it was really Tim Parker who was doing a lot of the pass progression. And he was so effective here. I don't know that we could expect him to be effective to the level that he was against NYCFC, which was about an 86% pass completion rate where Tim Parker was the, the center back who was stepping up, not just on the defensive assignments, but offensively, he was the one trying to play the ball upfield and start initiate a lot of those runs. It wasn't, I wouldn't classify it as playing out of the back, but I would say if, if Tim Parker and Joachim Nielsen settle into this kind of partnership where Nielsen has the least amount of touches on the field of any outfield player and Tim Parker has the highest pass completion percentage where he's the one driving the ball primarily if it's not Berkey, then I think they're going to have some success in the space that can open up when you have our fullbacks and you have Durkin and, and Leuven in the midfield and Tim Parker, his average position is so much higher on the field than Joachim Nielsen. You have these center backs that, yeah, they're the two back from, uh, from all of our players, but at the same time, Parker inherently has a little bit of a higher role and what he's able to do to initiate all these creating the space. It does wonders. And so I think with the banged up center back look that Austin has in not being able to press as high as St. Louis with the midfield questions of Austin that we're going to get into some of their key players in a moment, but the Sebastian drew question throws their entire midfield into chaos to an extent because they don't know who's going to play that attacking mid position. Nobody's as good as drew So they're going to put in guys like Danny Pereira or maybe Johan Valencia. And so those players playing that center attacking mid that Driussi was signed for and the whole team was designed around pulls from other areas of strength. And so you're not having your, your best defensive mid. You're not having your best attacking mid. You're having players who are your best players playing out of position because you need that. Tim Parker is a guy who can begin these progressions for us and really take advantage of that. My uh, brothers-in-law go crazy because they hate when Parker passes it a little <laughs> like far forward and either it goes into a, a, a dark hole, like a really bad spot and gets turned yeah. over, or it's just like not a, a smart player for it to go to. I love his aggressiveness. So I kind of like, he's trying to be that modern center back, but they mm. go off on him. They hate when he does that, that 86% really pops out to me. That's incredible. And I mean, Maybe he's improving in, in his older ages, his later years. That's amazing. He's, he's being given the opportunity to just be a little more free. And I think he's really embracing that role. And besides Tim Parker, guys, I, I am very curious. If I had to, I'm going to toss out two combinations of players to us. And you tell me who you're most excited about seeing against Austin FC. I'm going to go with Tim Parker and Joachim Nilsson or Edu Leuven and Chris Durkin. Which partnership are you most excited to see on the field? Uh, Stu, let me start with you. An answer me this one. Which partnership? Uh, well, I, I was always a defender growing up, so I always love defensive partnerships. Um, but I think I know which one you're most excited about. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing at the notes changing right now. Yeah. yeah. What is it, Stu? What is it? Uh I, I think uh, I think Matt's really really excited about that Leuven Durkin combination and also seeing that smile on his face. Did did you guys? So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna a quick aside on why I'm so excited because it it deserves explanation. Um, Edu Leuven had media availability on Thursday and I had the opportunity to ask him how he felt about Chris Durkin and did he feel a little more freed up by the way Durkin was playing and. 
Edu Leuven's answers were almost like just a kid in a candy shop for what Chris Durkin was bringing to him. So much so that he told a story about how Durkin came up to him before the game and said that he wanted to free him up. He wanted he was going to to do the dirty work and, and to to make sure that he had space and he was able to do what he needed to do more freely. And so Leuven put so much expectation on his defensive work. And he, he talked about how he goes home and he immediately watches the game again to, to study himself, to study the tape and that level of dedication. And when he talks about Stu, the defensive minded work, first and foremost, when he's asked not to be that number six, he has that, he has that mindset of him at all. And, and to be able to be so free because you can trust the player next to you to that point that Durkin showed, that's why this partnership has so much potential and why I'm so excited to see it. But Santi, Agree on the midfield, defensive, or maybe even the Sam Klaus partnership? I'm I'm going to go with the Nilsson Parker. Yeah, it's exciting uh, to see that Leuven and Dorkin partnership growing and and uh, both of them getting more used to each other and the way Dorkin is helping Leuven. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I'm just so excited about uh, what Nilsson has been doing. And uh, you have to uh, consider that he missed almost two weeks of preseason and the fact that he has played uh, in the, these two MLS games, he has played 90 minutes and uh, he's just he just keeps getting better and better uh, every game. And, and that's what we were hoping uh, for when he was signed. Obviously, he, he had that injury that sidelined him most of the year last year. And uh, then when, when he came back, uh, it was still like... A, like uh, a process to get back and uh, control minutes. But uh, I, I like a lot what I'm seeing from him. And this Nilsson Parker uh, partnership is going to be key uh, this year. So uh, so I'm going with that one. Bilbo Swaggins agrees with you. That was the Nilsson I've been hoping to see. He said it earlier in the chat. Um, his speed still worries him a little bit. I, I don't disagree. I was worried in the beginning of the RSL game that he was going to run out of gas because he was really having to sprint a lot in the beginning. But he was very much a bend but never break kind of player throughout that game. And the next one, too, obviously he was incredible. So not worried about that. But I want to just to quickly agree that like Durkin and Leuven is what I've been so excited about ever since we got Durkin. And ever since, since especially I saw the first preseason game with those two because it, it actually surprised me to hear Durkin say that he's going to protect Leuven and let him get, have freedom. Because when Durkin's even playing that six role, that very back protective role in front of the center backs, he's still moving a lot. And yeah. you just feel so comfortable that if he's going to get the ball, you're not worried about him losing it. You're not worried about him being stuck in a bad position. And that gives Leuven freedom too, like even less worries to be able to have a, a guy that's a veteran that's not going to get stuck anywhere. It's That's been my favorite thing. So that's my vote as well. Um, but, uh, Matt, I want to kick it back to you, of course, because we have a lot more to cover here on the flip side. I asked the Austin, we are Austin TV guys about some of the key players for Austin and some of them we've mentioned here, but let's understand a little bit about why they're key players. We know Sebastian Driussi. He's the type of guy that can create something out of nothing. And if left unattended, he's just going to go ham. But by all accounts, we're not going to have to deal with him this weekend. Hader Obrian. Good 1v1 qualities, making him dangerous for sneaking a ball into the box. He's a guy who our fullbacks are going to have their hands full dealing with, whether he starts on the left or right side. Danny Pereira in the midfield, best under pressure that handles all the ball carrying going forward, but will he be asked to play more of an attacking role? Uh, the question to watch when you watch the starting lineups come out on Saturday are going to be, where is Danny Pereira and where is Johan Valencia? Valencia, they call the center defensive mid who can drop back between the center backs and recover some of the balls that are kicked back there. So you wonder, is is his attacking going, is his ball progression going to be leveraged? Is, is, who is going to be that number six pivot or how are they going to line those midfielders up? Because they've alternated a little bit between a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-3-3. It depends on, I think, I, I would say it depends on Sebastian Driussi's availability, but Knowing that he's not there, a 4-3-3 seems pretty likely for us to see in that regard where they might have uh, Valencia and Pereira able to drop both drop back if they need to. And then Diego Rubio, guys, we've talked about him. Diego Rubio, Jossie Jardes, it's a 1A, 1B, but it's not it's not a Klaus Sam 1A, 1B in their form right now, I think. So it's, it's like 1C, 2C type of thing. <laughs> and 
and Stu mentioned a little bit about Zardes earlier. And if that's your top flight guy at this point in his career, you're going to have a bad day. Diego Rubio has played the, the lion's share of work. He came in against Minnesota. He played more, most of the minutes against uh, Seattle. He can keep center backs busy. He's good distributing up top for someone else to take a shot. But unfortunately right now there might not be that person to take a shot. And then they, they gave credit to Brad Stuver who had two huge games already for him. We talked about the fact that Austin, Austin couldn't get many shots off. They couldn't get many shots on target at all. It was Brad Stuver who has been credited for just saving them from absolute worst results to where their goal differential is just a minus one at this point. Good stuff, Matt. I think uh, it's a good time to start talking about our lineups. We have a little bit of time, so we don't have to rush through it necessarily, but let's just go in a circle here, list our lineups, and uh, talk about our score predictions as well. Matt, let's start with you as always. Well, you want to start with what we think Austin might go out with because we were given a projected sure. lineup from We Are Austin TV. So that looks like, yeah, that looks like a 4-3-3. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be a little nimble because they were hopeful that they would have Sebastian Driussi. This this was given to me right before that news that came out from Josh mm -hmm. Wolf. So Brad Stuver and Net obviously their back line, they have consisting of John Gallagher, Matt Hedges, Julio Cascante and Zan Kolmanik with Johan Valencia, Danny Pereira, and they listed Sebastian Driussi. I'm going to list uh, Alex Ring in the starting lineup for him. Mm -hmm. So Valencia, Pereira, Ring, and then Obrien, Rigoni, and Rubio up front, with Rubio being that nine, and then Obrien and Rigoni as the wings. Their prediction was 2-1 St. Louis, and that was with Driussi in the lineup, so you can only see writing on the wall of what they would think without Driussi. For me, and Santi and I talked about this early on Thursday, I'm going to go with we run it back from the NYCFC lineup. I think it was so clinical that I'm not even sure I received an answer from Bradley Carnell about what they could do better from that NYCFC matchup as far as getting the progressing the ball so clinically, getting the ball into dangerous zones, and getting the kinds of shots off that they need to to dump goals in, to just pour it on. And so I, I'm fairly certain I didn't get an answer to what can they improve. And that leads me to think with all the positivity we're hearing that Carnell is going to run it back with Berkey and net Markanic at left back, Nielsen and Parker center back, Totland right back, Durkin and Leuven in the midfield, Salio Pompeu, AZ Jackson, Indiana Vasilev, our attacking mids and Sam and Denneran up top. I'm going to go three, one St. Louis. Santiago, any, any adjustments, any changes? Yeah, just to know, just to not go with with the same. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Like, uh, and I I always think uh, if you win and it's a good win, you shouldn't change anything. But just to uh, throw a little bit of change, I'm gonna I'm gonna put Klaus and uh, AC doesn't start. So uh, that's mm -hmm. that's my only adjustment. Um, but I have a feeling uh, that it could be either way. Uh, maybe we'll see the same team. Something we don't see. We didn't see very often last True. year. And as far as uh, the score prediction, I'm going with 1-1. One, 1-1, one. One, one. okay. That's a fair away prediction. That's that's a pragmatic yeah, away prediction. Because d don't forget, MLS, it, a caveat to everything, it is difficult to win away in MLS, no matter what. No matter how well the matchup favors you, no matter how high you think you're flying, how injured the other team is, Away at MLS is difficult, and a bunkered team is a team that doesn't give up many goals. Absolutely, yeah. I was actually thinking one one myself. St Stuart, what do you think about the lineup? Uh, seems like we're differing on kind of the attackers mainly. Any thoughts from you? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't think anyone really played badly to lose their spot in the lineup. And uh, mm -hmm. if you have the hot hand in uh, Sam and and you keep starting him up top. Um, Part of me wonders if we would flip uh, Celio to the right, rest Indy, and maybe start Nukvi. Um, but I think we're probably going to see the same lineup as New York City FC. That's interesting. So one thing that really struck me in a recent extra time was they were talking about Klaus being double teamed, which is something I've been wanting to watch closely. And perhaps that's why he hasn't been uh, quite as effective as far as goal scoring, I mean, clearly the man still has great passing and he is playing deeper this year. So I don't know if there's anything to this, 
But I was thinking if we want Klaus to get going, if that's something we care about, I don't know if it is. I actually think Sam and Klaus playing together is the best way to get that going, especially with Sam's uh, scoring streak he's been on lately. So I will just say a 4-2-2-2 and just replace AZ with Klaus and Sam together instead of, you know, one striker. So I'd like to see that at some point, even if it doesn't happen in this one for that exact reason, maybe we try to get Klaus some goals. Let's do some score predictions. So Santiago gave a one, one uh, prediction. Stuart, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to go two, one and just guessing that we're going to have uh, Matt Hedges own goal. <sighs> Oh no! It's like continuing Poor the hedges. center back struggles against St. <laughs> Louis City. Not to pile on you, Kippy. Uh, I'm gonna say two one because I don't think Juicy's gonna play, and I I do think we might get the edge. But I am worried about this for all the reasons that Matt kind of gave. Uh, once Santiago gave his one one prediction, uh, Matt, let's finish with you. Any yeah, final I, thoughts. I had I had mentioned three one earlier. I'm going to revise it after I gave my own caveat. I I think it'll I'll go down to two nothing. I I do okay. like I do like this matchup a lot, uh, but I three goals away is a lot, and so I'm going to I'm going to dial it back a little bit and get a little more real. Um, <laughs> no, I I do think this is going to be a, a similar mindset to New York City FC. Everything we learned from this week in the press conferences and in trainings really indicated that. Bradley Carnell liked what he saw and they felt like they had a good week. And I think they're using this to build on what New York city FC offered St. Louis. It's a chance to continue the rise, maybe start another win streak or the first win streak of the season and, and get going. And Austin is fighting against all of the preseason predictions that they had where they're expected to finish 13th or 14th in the league in, in the Western conference. And, and I don't think they're well equipped to jump out of that, that bin right now. I think St. Louis can be in the driver's seat away, one thing I do want to say before we dial off on uh, the Big 550 KTRS is I do want to wish a very happy birthday to Caden Glover, our Ooh. first homegrown signing. His birthday is on March 8th, Friday, and so he'll turn 17. He's attending the U.S. Youth National Team Camp in Florida next week, I think it is. So happy birthday and have fun in Florida. Yeah, the question has been answered for me whether he's going to get any sub minutes before the uh, City 2 season starts. The answer is no, it looks like. <laughs> um, well, let's just close with this. I like the shout of another clean sheet, Matt. Colton Cook said at the end here that Parker and Nilsson could fight over Defender of the Year votes if mm. they keep playing this well together. A uh, second clean sheet would be lovely to see. So that's a fun one. Um, I don't know if anyone's got that CONCACAF fever, but it's a burner tonight with Nashville versus Inter-Miami. Two to one, Messi just scored a goal. It's a fun one. So everyone, please enjoy your soccer. I know I'm excited for Saturday's game, tonight's game. If you're listening on the big 550 KTRS, Matt's got one more thing to say before we go. And if you are listening on the Big 550 KTRS, make sure to download our podcast, Flyover Footy, wherever you get your podcast to listen to our wind down, which we go a little deeper and have a little more fun. And so that's available wherever you get your podcasts as soon as you can. Again, we're Flyover Footy. Look us up. We appreciate any likes and subscribes. And we're about to go into deeper detail on the wind down, which is the extended part of our podcast. So please join us. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you guys later. Go City. Okay, hey, we're up. Hooray. And if you're a first time listener and a watcher, rather, viewer, whatever you call it, <laughs> to uh to our live streams. Both. Um yeah, this is, this is the part of our podcast where we we have wrapped up our first 45 that we air on the Big 550 KTRS every Saturday before City Games. We take a little bit of a break to go grab a drink, wind down, maybe check the score of the Nashville Miami game and see what things are doing, and we'll be right back for another little chat, wind down. If you have any questions, toss them into uh, YouTube. Facebook, X, Instagram, wherever you're watching, and we will get to them.
Doc, definitely, definitely Phil watching that Nashville Miami game on a second monitor as he's talking had to sl- had to slip in that mention because it is a uh, we're, we're going to have a little bit of a Nashville conversation here in a minute. I think they've earned some they've earned some talk. Is Scheffelberg still officially the fastest player in MLS this year, 2024? <laughs> he was in 2023, I believe. If he's not, he's got to be up there. Well, this isn't technically an MLS match, so it depends on how you're keeping stats. He, he had a he had a nice fast break earlier when he scored that goal. He just found himself in the open in the box on the back post, and it was, yeah. Still 2-1 in the second half. Oh, Schaffelberg has both of the goals. Yeah. yeah. The first one was good. Woo. Yeah, the first one was really good. Oh, my gosh. I missed another goal, didn't I? Offside. Okay. I missed the second Schaffelberg goal, but Nashville's looking good. Yes, they are. Um, Stu, you sticking with us? I'll probably head out. Um, time to get some sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, no I'm such an old man. You've <laughs> earned it. Absolutely. Family's good, though. Felicity? Yeah, everything's good. And Felicity turns a year in a few in next week. So you got to be fucking kidding right. me. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. Yep. It's uh, so. The March 17th Ooh. game versus San Jose was the one I was watching oh in the hospital the uh, day after she was born. 3 oh, 0 win over San Jose. And uh, let's go. I missed talking to the Muni- Mooney family um, after that yeah. one. Mark right. and uh, his wife were, I guess, going to gonna chat, but always love seeing them around. Absolutely, man. Good memories. All right. Well, do you want to hang around real quick and say anything, or you want to dip out now? No, I'll dip out now. Just um, uh, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about the uh, Inter Miami Nashville fan fallout. But uh, I'll oh, catch yeah. that you in the morning have, when I. You won't have to wait long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll uh, catch that tomorrow on on uh, my download. Sounds good, man. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us, man. Yep. See you, nice Stu. Okay, you guys good? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Oh no, no. Oh, I streamed for a second on accident with this other program. Hope that goes away. <laughs> Phil's running three streams over there. <laughs> <laughs> it was for a, a second. Welcome everyone to the wind down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt, what like, do we what do we got tonight? I like that sound. Me too. It's a good sound. I've got a citywide from Forehands. Perfect. Forehands actually uh I went to their Chesterfield uh, out of the district, that location for the first time this weekend. They it's it has a high point there as well and a huge outdoor space. I mean, they take full advantage of that West County life out there. And it is a nice place if you haven't been. Just a big screen outside. They've got MLS season pass, so they've got games. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a fun place to go, and they have that new citywide light on tap too. So good oh, times yeah. with forehands lately, dude. I had that on on draft for the first time um, a couple games ago. The Houston game at home. Mm. It was really good on draft. Highly recommend it. I've only had it in cans, and I've had a lot of them in cans. So. Uh, Stu- uh, Stu- sorry, Santiago. What are you drinking? Oh, I'm just drinking a uh, Estrella Jalisco. Um, mm-hmm. I um, like for when I got back from Puerto Rico, I didn't drink anything for about a month. So right now, I'm just drinking what I, what what was already in the fridge. So uh, mm-hmm. I haven't bought anything new recently. Well, um, I'm do you want to happy- start off with Nashville? 
Yeah, I mean, I was about to say, I, I'm half watching Inter Miami Nashville as we kind of chat here. And, and the it's benefits, really as I said earlier, it's been a nice one, but the, be- the benefits drama, of streaming, right? right? I mean, the benefits of streaming during a game are you have you have the drama that we know existed between Nashville and Miami before the game that Nashville had a lot of self-inflicted wounds on. And now you're watching the greatest player of all time and his <laughs> his compatriots play in Nashville. So I'll, I'll let you take a take a beat and watch the game for a second, Phil, because <laughs> I want to talk about the Nashville supporters kerfuffle that happened this week. <laughs> Nashville has uh, made some interesting moves. So if anybody is not familiar, um, Geodis Park is where Nashville plays. They have this big, nice supporter section that is not unlike City Park over in the at one of their ends. And the entire bottom bottom deck, uh, bottom section is safe standing, supporter section, supporter groups, all, all this stuff. You have to wear the colors of your team to be in that section. That's that's a standard supporter section. That's what Nashville has. It's not anything out of the ordinary. It's, in fact, very run-of-the-mill for all MLS teams. And so this week, with Miami, with Nashville just qualifying for CONCACAF Champions Cup, I think round of 16 to face Miami, when it was found out that Miami would be coming to Nashville and Messi would be coming, Nashville announced through their supporters that two sections at the end of their supporters section, sections 105 and 111 that are at the very ends, would be allowed to have inter-Miami colors. And you see that and you think, there's no way they would allow visiting fan colors in those supporter sections. Well, what ended up happening is back in January, and this this is where I saw it because of this glorious website called the Wayback Machine, where you could go check web pages before edits were made to them. You see that on Nashville's website, they rebranded or they restructured those two end sections from safe standing to seated. And so they add seats, but they they branded them to their fans on their website, marketed them as seated supporter section seats. You have all of the benefits of being in the mix of the supporter section, be in the mix of the rowdiness with the most passionate of Nashville SC fans, but you have the benefit of an assigned seat. Okay, I can I can get behind that. That's an interesting concept. And so fast forward to this week when suddenly it's not a seated supporter section. Suddenly it's seated general admission and mm. you get a seat, but it's just like all the other general reserve seats we have at city park where you can wear whatever the heck you want. And Nashville fans rightly flipped their lids because not only have they removed two sections of of that supporter section, but now they are going back saying it was just a mistake because Nashville SC released a statement that it was just a mistake that they had branded it as part of the supporter section. And now Nashville fans are just up in arms, rightly so, I think, because of how this looks, the the inability of Nashville to work with their supporter groups, the going back, allowing visiting fan colors into sections you've previously designated as your supporter section. And it all goes back to the fact that it's yet another chapter in MLS teams doing whatever they want to, to both. This was also coming off, off the heels of jacking ticket prices up for Messi. So you're seeing not just MLS teams, Nashville being the latest to jack ticket prices up for Messi, but you're seeing some weird placation of inter Miami fans so that you, I don't know if you didn't think you could sell out your stadium for your own fans, but offering more area for the pink of Miami to appear. None of it seems I, it, it boggles my mind given what, what we know in the history of MLS, the clubs, the supporter groups, the supporter sections, but also the experiences we have here in St. Louis with City, I could never see our organization doing that or attempting to do that to their own fans. And so it, that's one of those things that boggles my mind that really sets a dark cloud over what is otherwise an exciting time. I mean, Messi going to these stadiums, it should be exciting. It should be viewed as a bit of a spectacle in the, in the sense of it all, but also the opportunity for your home team to beat Messi and his, his friends who he's brought from Barcelona. So all of this shrouding that the the club has done with the ticket prices and with the supporter section, such a bad look that Billy says in chat, so spot on. 
What do you think about this, Santiago? I'm I'm a little bit out, so I might give an outside perspective here, but I'd, I'd like to hear what you think first. Yeah, no, I, I don't like it. Um, not sure what the reasoning was for uh, making that change, but uh, the supporter section is the supporter section. I don't think uh, putting um, and the way they, they marketed it and then they said it was a mistake, but I don't think putting seating sections at the end uh, even if it is general admission i i just don't like that and yeah it's good to market it as oh yeah you, you will be like in the middle of the action but uh i wonder if maybe they felt like uh they didn't have enough people that were going to uh to have a full supporter section and that's why they did it but don't like it and and then uh just uh the way they they handled it and and just uh, allowing uh, Miami here uh, on those sections, um, even if it's not the actual supporter section, they try to correct their mistake. Um, not not a good look, uh, not good marketing, and not good planning. So um, I don't like it. Uh, to some extent, um, I I don't know how how City will handle it. Uh, I will expect something different, but to some extent, I, I'm glad Miami is not coming here with Messi uh, unless he plays for longer than uh, what his contract is until 2025. Um, I don't think we're going to have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what, what's the cynical take here? Like, what what's the cynical thoughts that perhaps the front office was thinking when they decided to change this rule? Or do you think it was an accident? Well, one of the thoughts is that there's a, such a disconnect or lack of caring between ownership and the messaging that's going out to fans. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of blame being laid on the fact that they had this labeled as the supporter section on their website. And now it's ownership kind of dictating without regard to what's happening. And so in that in that sense, there's a you got to feel for some of the front office folks or some of the business side people, social media who are basically just following orders and putting out what they're told to put out. Like we listed on our website from what ownership says, ownership doesn't think enough to know the difference, possibly. So the cynical take is that Nashville's front office ownership, Ian Ayers on up to whoever owns Nashville is so out of touch for what's going on. And they're either not listening to the people at the level of a GM, a sporting director, a CEO, or they don't care to listen. And so this would be akin to if we did it, you know, the blame, the buck would stop at Carolyn Kindle, but you would have to point to the level of um, Diego Giuliani. And so I think that's Ian, Ian Ayer's level at Nashville. And so you, I, I view it as a uh, out of touch and, they don't, they feel like they don't need to care maybe because they feel they have this brand new stadium that seats 30,000. They just sold out of season tickets for the first time, I believe. And they feel a sense of entitlement, a sense of they, they can't lose what they've gotten. Like they, their market is so sunk to them that they're not going to fight back. And there's not going to be this massive black eye. There may be a social media firestorm, but what's that gonna what's that gonna hurt a week or two from now? I'm not gonna be tweeting about Nashville anymore a week or two from now. So what are they gonna do locally to con continue to push back? And by all accounts, it doesn't sound like much. This the president of the backline of Nashville SC supporter groups in the stadium. So they're their supporter groups, they have seven of them, I believe, seven recognized supporter groups that combine to form a backline. That's the collective name of their supporter groups in oh. the stadium, the backline. So there's a president of the back line, and he actually released a pretty lengthy statement on X today that was almost trying to be as transparent as possible, but also venting because his opinion or his statement is that the back line is there to support all recognized supporter groups. And if the supporter groups all agree on a course of action, a course of protest or what to do in the stadium, then he will support that and follow through and give them all the, the, the wherewithal that they need. But if they don't all agree, then it's up to the individual supporter groups to peacefully do what they want to do. And he, he didn't mince words by saying they didn't all agree on how they were going to protest or how they were going to make a statement. Uh -huh. And so you wonder if this is going to have any lasting effects for Nashville or if this is just going to be one of those things that they have to their fans have to deal with and it just blows over. 
Well, this is a, a good lesson. I was about to say, it sounds like since they were saying this was just a con, you know confusion, they kind of b tried to back out of it the best way they can. It sounded like the SGs did their job, right? They threw a fit for the right reasons, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, justice was done. Owners aren't perfect. Vice presidents or whatever aren't perfect. So, <laughs> you know, it, it ended right in the end, right? But um, I guess they need to make sure that they're united in their stance because that's an interesting excuse that the uh, front office gave to not listen to an SG, right? Is that kind of, am I saying that right? Am I breaking that down correctly? I think so. Yeah. If they're not united, that they don't have to listen to them. If they don't all agree on one, one path, that's scary to me. I don't like that language. Um, and you know, of course I'm, I'm thinking about the open cup here and, uh, right. what St. Louis has been leading the way on that, um, with their SGs, but my goodness, if they're able to say something like one SG didn't agree with all the others a hundred percent, so we don't have to listen to you. That's boy, that's pretty gross. Yeah. Uh, my, I will, my, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Matt, do you know by chance how big that section was before the changes? How many people it could hold? I I don't have the exact number. I okay. think it was around 3,000. It was okay. a pretty pretty similar, if not the same size as St. Louis. It was a 2,700 to 3,000. Yeah, I, I find it hard to believe that they will not be able to uh, have to get 3,000 people to, to yeah. be there. So seriously, it, it's a very... Uh, I, I don't know what went into that decision, but very bad look. Yep. It just seems to me like a, a silly mistake that they just didn't think it through. And you, Matt, that's basically what you were saying. But I will say, like, from an outsider perspective, I think I was caught off guard with this. Um, you know, I, I don't claim an SG necessarily, but um, the first time I came across this was when SKC fans came to St. Louis. And then I went to the playoff game in Kansas City and both you know they were worried about not being able to walk into the sg sections with their jerseys and so i think they played it safe and i did the same i wore my away jersey so it wouldn't stick out in kansas city and so i guess i hadn't been so um been told about this before that moment because in st louis fc no one policed this i guess i yeah. thought this was like uh one of those bad mls commercial we're taking away your freedoms <laughs> so we can have more money or look better on TV even is something as silly as that. <laughs> so I guess I just saw it as something silly. Um, but I, but then I thought, well, the Dortmund wall, there's no way they're going to allow like a red or a green shirt in the wall at Dortmund either. So yeah. I don't know how cynical it is to have that rule. That's a good, it's a good um, metaphor because one of the other complaints is that, and we've, we've seen examples of the, types of hooliganism in Europe where rival supporter groups or rival ultras actually battle like they fight. And mm -hmm. so there's a, there is concern because they haven't had to deal with this before of you're allowing visiting supporters into essentially your section. There's no walls. There's no barriers. There's no, there's nothing separating sections 105 and 111 from the what's inside of them. And so you're having Miami fans or, I guess at this point, any other away fans able to sit right next to your standing supporter section where only home team colors are allowed and your supporter groups are. And so what does that mean for fan safety is another aspect of this that I hope we don't hear anything about because no news is good news in that regard. Mm -hmm. But it does introduce a problem, a potential problem that exists when when you put passionate soccer fans in the close proximity like that. Like if trash talking goes too far, we've seen this kind of thing in NFL stadiums where drunk idiots will get a hold of each other in the stands and just start fighting. Hmm. It's not out of the realm of possibility that that could be introduced because of this decision. Interesting stuff. I'd like to hear from uh, listeners on this one. So please do kind of send us a DM or if you hit, want to hit us up in the chat real quick <laughs> before we move on too quickly. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting one to me, uh, cause it's new to me, but this has all been fun. It's been good to talk about. Um, I want to talk about the open cup shortly. I don't want to go too deep on it, but should we talk about something else first? This is just a quick one, really. Yeah, let's, I mean, let's talk about the open cup. I've got a few things about Austin that we could probably circle back and spend some time talking about right. some individual St. Louis folks. But if you want to talk about the open cup, I think that's good. We, you know, we, we didn't really touch on the actual news news itself, but I think by now it's oh, yeah. pretty apparent to anybody listening. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, you know everything. So I just thought there were some really cool updates. And actually, Stuart sent us one um, as we were talking here a few minutes ago. So I'll try to add this in, too, if, if, I, if I do all right. Um, but Fabian um, Rinkel, uh, Rinkel um, posted uh, something that he asked. Jose was to ask Luchi Gonzalez at the Quakes in San Jose about the Open Cup. And the quote that I, the part of the quote that really stood out to me is he said, Lucci said, the decision to be in the U.S. Open Cup was not up to him, but instead up to the owner of the club and the commissioner. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was super interesting. And then it was like minutes later that I saw what the Chicago Fire uh, VP, or sorry, MLS VP, Nelson Rodriguez. MLS VP referring, yeah, Nelson Rodriguez referring to Chicago Fire. Yeah, Thank you for the correction there. I do think he says, I do think the possibility of allowing clubs to choose their own destiny is real. And we'll discuss that with our clubs and U.S. soccer. And that does lead right into what Stuart told me or messaged us. I mean, I don't know how real this is. I'm just now getting this. But Logan Squares is on there. I assume that's an SG or something like that. Uh, the vote was tight. Keep pressuring your FOs, your front offices mm. and boycott League's Cup. And all first team friendlies make the anti MLS ownership groups pariahs that cost their fellow owners millions of dollars. Okay, we get the point. Um, <laughs> we don't want to be too angry here on this podcast, but um, no, I love that point. All of those points together being that this is up to presidents, um, and it sounds like someone inside MLS's leadership is open to the possibility of clubs choosing their own destiny. That's new, and that's an interesting spin. And if the vote was tight, that you know might make us think favorably about perhaps how our front office and, and owner perhaps voted in this in this argument. And if she voted in our favor, in that being St. Louis wants to be in the open cup and we get to choose our own destiny, then maybe we don't have to worry in the future. How do you guys think about feel about all those things? Yeah, I, I the context of that is the account uh, at U.S. Open Cup, which is the uh, volunteer the cup.us site had said uh in response to st louis stating they want to play in the u.s open cup but were denied permission that account said correct it was fully decided by the negotiating group the ussf board subcommittee and then mls executive leadership under direction from the board of governors which is the owners of each club employees under those owners likely had different opinions and then Logan yeah. Squares at Logan Squares said the vote was tight. Keep pressuring your FOs and boycott mm -hmm. Leagues Cup, all first team friendlies. Make the anti MLS ownership groups pariahs that cost their fellow owners millions of dollars. Delegitimize their short sighted arguments entirely. And that it that starts to border on um, some paranoia language. But the the crux of what they're trying to say is pretty appropriate. And it follows what the St. Luligans and other and Fleur de Noise and other St. Louis City SC supporter groups like Santos have have led the charge on, which is boycotting. I think all of the all of the recognized supporter groups were in um agreement with this one. They put out a joint statement with the Luligans, Santos, Fleur de Noise, Punks, Thieves, No Nap City Ultras or No Nap Ultras. They all agree that boycotting the League's Cup is an appropriate response to what is happening here. And if the vote was tight and if you're having coaches speak out about, and then be honest and GMs as well, you know, you're having teams put out statements and you can likely read the tea leaves of who's saying something, who's putting out statements and you could try and piece together who's done what on the votes. Uh, we know Cincinnati has been very hard on their statements of they want to be able to choose for themselves if MLS isn't going to be granted just complete entry. St. Louis has mentioned that they would have preferred to play in the Open Cup. Now you're getting a coach from San Jose. So to me, I want to speak I, on that. I, I do. Yeah, I do see. I do see that some of these clubs may be emboldened by their ownership's votes, but also those who haven't need this kind of pressure. Because this is yeah. such a legitimate, such a storied tournament, and it goes beyond and and in in separation from the desire to grow through entities like League's Cup. Like 
I'll pick up on that after you talk about the the St. Louis City thing, Phil. But I do have opinions on some of the feedback that we've seen related to the boycotts. It's quick. Uh, it's just it, there was a differentiation in in the series of of tweets that we mentioned there that um, there's a difference between how the owners voted and how front offices felt. And so you know Giuliani, we don't know if he has a vote. We know how he feels, but we don't know how Carolyn Kendall feels and how she voted, or whether Giuliani had the clearance to vote for her. We don't know where it stands, but I do think it's important to not to know that there's like, we're not sure what happened between the two, but it is nice to hear that Giuliani is on our side and maybe will be an advocate if he has any decision-making in the future. That's nice. But So one thing before I, uh, I go into my, my little tangent is in the chat, Chris Gebhardt uh, and Billy are talking about the, the olive and York, save the cup shirts. And so I do want to, I do want to plug that because Santi, the, the Santos STL Santos has done a remarkable job in coordinating this with Olive and York to save the cup t-shirt in red and white. So St. Louis city colors, you can wear it to games in Olive and They've got this out in multiple colors and they're doing a great job in raising visibility to this kind of an issue. So shout out to Santos for getting that done first and foremost. And also the league's cup that um, the, the references to the international friendlies, it, I don't think that it was the league's cup being referred to as international friendly. What I think happened is if you guys recall this week, one of the other under the radar controversies is Minnesota United two, I believe is in the U S open cup. They have a, they have a scheduled date for early April. That same day that the U.S. Open Cup is happening, Minnesota United scheduled an international friendly. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So the notion of fixture congestion, if it was hard to believe at first, and if it was being laughed at because of League's Cup and shooting yourself in the foot with that, I mean, this is... The emperor has no clothes None. on this yeah. wow. because you can't, they legitimately scheduled a friendly for their first team the day and week of their second team playing in the U S open cup after fixture congestion for their first team was cited as a reason not to participate in the U S open cup. Are you kidding me? Wow. The, the thing I don't get about the decision and how they, got to it and uh, eight teams from MLS will play. And those eight teams are basically after the teams that played in CONCACAF Champions Cup are the mm-hmm. the next eight teams on the Supporter Shield standings. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't get that at all because basically you are rewarding the teams at the bottom <laughs> of the table that yeah. did bad last year and you're relieving them from that a schedule congestion. I, I didn't get that at all. I, I don't know how they arrived to that decision. Oh, the poor, I mean, the proofs there. I mean, it, none of it makes sense and it's all lies for the wrong reasons. Uh, so it, it's nice that it's that easy. So I, I think our only problem now is, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about, I think the, the problem now, first of all, is that we have to let everyone know what the open cup is. And the last update is that um, St. Louis public radio did a great show on this and they put out a series of, of pictures on Instagram and all the, all the social media accounts um, kind of alerting to people saying the most important points for um, informing of what's happening with the open cup, why it's bad. You know, they did a great job giving just the basic stuff. And so I hope you guys are, blasting that out because it's our job to make sure that average uh sorry casual fans even as from the most passionate down to the casual fans understand what the open cup is why it's important and why it's a big deal that it's it's not happening the way that it has historically so it's it's our job to make sure that happens and so make sure if you find that oh that um stl public radio series of things on social media just like blast that out please do that and share it with everybody answer questions be friendly about it so that we can uh, be ambassadors for the open cup here in st louis but um i don't know how you guys feel mainly i just want to like 
please do touch on that, Matt, if that's what you want to talk about. But I'm also curious how you feel about each club getting their own choice in the Open Cup. It's a better option than what just happened. I'll yeah. say that. So I, if we talk about what plan to go into 2025 with, because th- th- this is not, this is a stopgap in 2024. What's happening now is a stopgap and that will not be the plan going forward. We've all but been told that. Yeah. And so I would prefer if every club got to choose, because then we could at least see, okay, who values this, this tournament and who doesn't, because yeah. we, we also feel like there are enough clubs that value it and they would want to play regardless of roster rule changes. My other, my other thought in reading through a lot of these comments is how all of this has been framed for not just not hardcore fans, not casual fans, but just fans, like how this discourse is occurring. And I think MLS has really been successful in driving this narrative, especially to fans who didn't have a vested interest in the U S open cup before what they've done is they've made it a, a, a league's cup versus U S open cup conversation. They've made it to where fans are now arguing the validity and the value to one cup over the other, as if it's not possible to play both. And that's where MLS has really won because I'm looking at a screenshot on Facebook right now in one of these St. Louis city fan groups where there is legitimately somebody who screenshotted the number of followers and likes for leagues cup on Facebook versus the number of followers and likes for us open cup on Facebook. And it's, it's like a factor of 10 difference skewed to the leagues cup. And so you're getting, you're getting these conversations where people are saying the U S open cup doesn't matter because who cares about any of these other teams anyway. And you're, you're starting. I mean, this is like soccer wars 3.5 where you're creating infighting and you're, you're having MLS cities or fans who are recent fans of MLS or who aren't have never been fans of USL or lower league soccer or anything like that, create this viewpoint of MLS is doing this to grow their business. Who doesn't want to grow the business? We're fans of MLS. Who wouldn't want to grow the team that we support and put them on an international stage? Like those are the conversations that are occurring right now because MLS has been successful in making this League's Cup versus U.S. Open Cup. The thing we just mentioned about Minnesota United proves that that is entirely a false dichotomy. Like there's nothing true about the fact that fixture congestion is a cause for pulling out of the US Open Cup. It is financial wherewithal, and that is it. All of these other conversations about field quality, about quality of opponent, about losing money, that I mean, that's where it really starts to drive to is MLS wants to make and maximize their potential. They're seeing they're seeing this as investments. And so I think I mentioned it on a pot or two ago, and I didn't mean to, but I ended up doing it, where I was I was comparing, I think, Leagues Cup and U.S. Open Cup to stocks and bonds, where as an investor, you look at bonds as the safe thing, the things you, you, you really have to do to keep your money, grow it a little bit, and, and there's no risk to it. That's U.S. Open Cup. Leagues Cup is these high yield stocks where you can just pour money into it as it's being a bull market, which soccer is a bull market right now, and you ride it to the moon, but you only have so much money to go around. And so you don't want to put it in US Open Cup. That's what MLS has done. That's what Liga MX has enabled MLS to do. And it also has been emboldened by the fact that Apple is now a partner to MLS and is encouraging MLS to do everything they can to primarily target their platform and their audience. And that includes doing less with U.S. Open Cup. All of this drives back to money. None of it drives back to the competition, the fixture congestion, the the roster rule restrictions that are in place. And so that's a trickle down to fans. And so going back to the fact that that has been so successful in the messaging to fans is why we're seeing the discourse that we are in these groups of people passionate about the boycott of League's Cup, of the supporter groups doing that, and then others arguing it's a little bit of arguing about you're punishing the players, you're punishing the team for something that they didn't want to do. But a lot of it is starting to turn into League's Cup is more valuable. We should be focusing on that. MLS has successfully been winning that argument in a lot of corners of the internet. Pretty gross. That's hard for me to take. 
Sorry, man. <laughs> but yeah, if you go uh, look at social media, yeah, um, I see a lot of comments, people like, especially people that are not familiar with uh, Open Cup and uh, maybe are new to uh, MLS and to soccer. Um, yeah, they don't know Open Cup. So uh, yeah, they, they see uh, the the side of uh, making money and what's more important and uh, what's higher level. But um, I don't know. And maybe it's us that uh, have a, a sweet spot for, for Open Cup just because uh, the history St. Louis has and also because we ourselves get to uh, experience some of uh, those games back in 2019 uh, or even 20, I don't remember the 2017, I think it was when Chicago Fire came to um, Soccer Park and uh, it was more than 6,000 people. Like uh, mm -hmm. those experiences uh, were, were great for us and uh, and uh, just the history and everything that uh, St. Louis has done around the Open Cup uh, makes it so special to us. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we're biased, but uh, I just don't like seeing that people don't... Uh, give it the importance, especially because it's people that are familiar with, a lot of these people are familiar with Premier League and uh, um, La Liga, and they know those tournaments, uh, yeah. um, Copa del Rey and FA Cup are important there. So uh, I don't see the argument about, about tournament <laughs> not being important. Um, it's just, uh, it, they're just picking sides uh, based on uh, convenience, I, at least that's, that's how I see it, but um, I hope uh, in 2025 uh, something different happens and hopefully a uh, city can play and other clubs that uh, I have voiced their opinion and uh, have expressed they want to be able to choose uh, will be able to, to, to play next year. And, and hopefully between um, US Soccer, MLS, uh, even Apple, if Apple will try to get in it and uh, maybe put some money in it and no. may, maybe add it to 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 apple to, to the apple platform uh, maybe it could be better for everybody do, do you disagree phil no i agree i oh. think it's a great idea mm -hmm. that'd be easier it'd be better um why not i mean it'd be funny if u.s soccer approached apple and said hey you want more games <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give them to you for free <laughs> just to just to get uh mls that would be really funny um no they need the money i'm sure but I, you know, I also, I, you were kind of alluding to this. It's kind of strange how people don't buy in, and it really weirds me out that there there are people out there defending League's Cup. Uh, we have our, our work cut out for us, everybody. But um, you know, Men in Blazers posted a video today. No matter how you feel about those guys, like they're great riders. Just like if you take out the soccer commentary, you take out everything else, they make a great turn of phrase. And so I think they did a great job representing what the open cup is in the United States. Um, so I hope you can give that to anybody that wants to learn about it. Uh, but he just talked about how valuable he even iron or he even like talked about doubles advocate, why the open cup may not be good for MLS, but he just talked about after that, the, the magic of the cup and, and how awesome it is. And, and like, what do you have if you don't have your history? And here we are in the United States. It's such a new country. And this is one thing where we actually have the history of the Open Cup and we can pull from this um, as MLS. They can use it, right? St. Louis uses it in, in their marketing and I hope they're able to use it again in the future for the right reasons. And um, you got to pull from it. And it's just funny to think that I just wish we had brought more people into St. Louis FC back in the day because I think they would get it. You know, if we could have gotten 10,000 people out to that stadium on a regular basis or whatever the max is, 7,000 or so, man, it, they would be more educated. They would they would get it, you know, like they would understand why we're so worked up. They would never defend the League's Cup. You know, they, they would understand what's going on. And it's just there are just so many new fans to MLS, to soccer in the United States. They just they're very Americanized sports fans. It's, it's just the way it is. So again, we got our, our work cut out for us. I think they can get it. I think they could really love it like we do, but they have to experience it. Right. <laughs> Speaking of experiences for anybody who's watching us on the live stream, you're experiencing it with us. But if you're listening back on the podcast, you'll know exactly what moment we were recording. Yeah. 
Luis Suarez just tied the game, Miami Nashville, 90 plus five. How wow. unreal is that for a moment? You speak, and Luis you speak, Suarez. Luis Suarez. And Messi had scored the the goal at just after half. And I mean, that's those are the beautiful, those are the beautiful moments, you know, regardless of how a team was constructed or, you know, all of the off the field stuff. Those are the beautiful moments. Seven minutes of extra time too. So I'll be excited to hear what the, the coach. Yeah, yeah there will that. be a lot of chatter about that for sure. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that I actually, I, I would love to be in these competitions, but there is a level of um, enjoyment I get from watching these other teams. Even if we've been bounced from a tournament that we were in knowing that, you know, the, everything we talked about earlier, we have some good vibes going in St. Louis with what what we have building with this team and the competition that we're in right now with the MLS regular season. And yeah, we we won't get Leagues Cup this year, and it is absolutely devastating. And what what's going to happen with the Leagues Cup is going to happen, but it's not going to diminish the support that we give to St. Louis City and our players in MLS. And I am so very much looking forward to watching them play against Austin, though. I do have to say, guys, since we're like, I don't know, an hour, 20 minutes into this or something, um, this is where we can go complete honesty. Um, th I'm going to miss my first live St. Louis City game this weekend. Oh, wow. What? We have a we have a trivia trivia night for our elementary school. The PTO is having a trivia during the Austin game. And if you guys know, know if trivia, you should have fessed up to this, Matt, I'm. I'm judging you it's, hard right now. It's the it's the citywide. It's bringing the I'm honesty kidding. out at the end yeah. of the podcast. So so fun. Yeah, this is my test for people who listen to the length of the podcast. Like, give me <laughs> flack on give like me that. flack on X. Give me flack on Twitter, on Instagram, or whatever for for not being able to watch the game live, not live tweeting like I usually do. Um, because if you've ever been to a trivia night, you know that you are not allowed to use those phones. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, have you to can sneak. just. I'm going to have to sneak the uh, radio broadcast in my ear with Joey and Jen and Dale Shilly. You can just tell them uh, it's CD uh, that you're not looking for answers or anything like that. Maybe they'll give you some special permission or something. Yeah, I think guys, you need we, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. But <laughs> we'll, we'll still have Fallout on Sunday either way. I'll, I'll watch the game after we get home. I promise that. <laughs> All right. The third fallout of the season. I'll put yes. my corrections at the end of the episode as well. Which we're kind of live streaming too. That's another thing that I, like I don't know it. that we did that a lot last year, but um, we, we're just tossing up a, a chat, tossing up the tossing up the live stream Sunday morning, eight a.m. I I didn't. I thought that went fairly well, so we might try to do that throughout this year. Unless the vibe is nice. Yeah, the vibe I like is the nice. coffee thing, like, and it's early. Yeah. It's nice, right? Yeah, get yeah, a cup of coffee, yeah. sit down, watch the stream. Here's some about City. Maybe put on the game on a replay, watch the highlights while you're listening to us and mm -hmm. see how much full of garbage we are in our takes. Or if you agree <laughs> with us, which I hope you do. Love it. Well, that's it from us today, guys. Um, as usual, we uh, ranted until we ran out of time, plus a little bit more. So if you made it this far, I appreciate it. Give Matt some crap. For uh, missing the game, in all honesty, I've missed a, a million matches at this point. I go out of town a lot, and I enjoy it. So I've, you know, give me more trash than Matt for sure. Uh, but that's it. Yeah, flyover footy. Thanks so much for making it this far. We'll talk to you guys next time. Enjoy the game. Go city. Let's go.